Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Cornerstone Barristers webinar on accommodating asylum seekers and legal issues arising from the use of hotel accommodation. My name is Kildred Bogle. I'm a barrister in the public law team, and I'm going to be joined today by Dean Underwood, Joseph Cannon and Jack Barber, who are all members of the public law team and practice across the various aspects of uh, Chambers areas that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, as I mentioned, we are at something like 500 people registered for the seminar and the numbers are continuing to go up. But I'm conscious that many of you may have only allocated this hour in order to be able to view this webinar. So we are going to get started. It is going to be recorded. So if you um, do happen to miss any of this because you have to rush off or um, weren't able to start at the beginning of it, it will be put up on our website once um, the recordings are available and has been um, downloaded. It's also um, worth knowing that uh, if you've got colleagues that want to view it, it's not the viewing is not restricted to those people that are registered. And if you've got others that would like to you think might be interested in the content, do feel free to share the link with them when it goes up on our website and they'll be able to view it through that. So just to give you a bit of background, we um, this seminar came about mainly as a result of a suggestion that Jack made about how he had noticed that there were several issues coming up around the increasing number of asylum seekers that were arriving on small boats, but not principally small boats, but, but uh, mainly small boats, and how that was an increasing concern, and how uh, so many members of chambers were involved in disparate, different aspects of advising on what is becoming a growing problem and a, and a growing concern. And that's evidenced not least by the fact that there are, uh, as I say, so many people registered to join us today from all aspects of local government, central government, and um, all sorts of other organizations and individuals. And uh, clearly there's a humanitarian side to all of this. And there are some very sensitive issues around what, what's happening. And clearly more needs to be done, um, perhaps, I say clearly, certainly my view is that more needs to be done to try and stop the problem in the first place in terms of the arrival of the small boats um, and, and what could be done at all, and, and that side of things. And that's something for the politicians. But the real issues for local authorities and other public bodies are um, very real and it, it comes down very much to resourcing. And I'm going to give you an example of one of the cases I've been involved in, which related to a very heavily populated local authority who in uh, their area already had a wait list for school places and long wait times to see GPs and access other resources. This was for the local population. And they were told that another hotel was going to be stood up uh, in their area for emergency accommodation. And, and the rule suggests that you're supposed to be given notice and be consulted. But the reality is there's very little in terms of consultation going on, if any consultation is going on at all. And that, that I, I do know of occasions when the uh, in, the information that this hotel is going to be put to this purpose is only communicated to the local authority after the facility has come into operation. And when there's very little they can do in terms of making representations about its use. And that's what had happened here. Um, this whole particular hotel was designed for emergency accommodation. And the principle there that uh, and no doubt Jack will come on to in a bit more detail, is that people are supposed to stay in that accommodation for 48 hours or up to 48 hours and then be dispersed to, to longer term accommodation. However, the issue is that because there's such a dearth of longer term accommodation, people are staying in hotel emergency accommodation, so-called, for much longer than 48 hours. And with this particular authority, there, there were 45 children, uh, asylum seeking children in their area, who have been in a hotel accommodation for over five weeks. And there comes a point at which that local authority is going to owe duties to that individual uh, as a child in need in their area. And of course, as you'll know, those duties are owed regardless of immigration status. And so there, there is a demand on local resources in terms of schooling, uh, on, in terms of uh, medical services and, and all the other support services that need to be put in place. And there have been a lot of questions that have come about in the instructions that have come to Chambers about what can be done about the situation, not least because the Home Office is breaching its own policies in relation to target ratios and uh, how many, um, what number of accommodation, what, come, what number of asylum seekers there ought to be per capita of population. 
Uh, there are also issues, as you know, around um, using a hotel as long term accommodation and whether that gives rise to planning issues. And that's something that Joe is going to be covering in his session or in relation to poor standards of some of these accommodations. And we've heard on the news stories of disused barracks being used, of uh, former student accommodation being used and, and whether or not that's of an appropriate standard for occupation in this way. And then some of that ties in with the work that Dean does. He's our expert in chambers on um, houses in multiple occupation and the housing standards that need to be applied to some of these um, cases. And he'll be covering some of those. Uh, Jack will set out some of the context and give us some of the data behind uh, how we've got to this place in terms of the statistics. And, and you'll know for those of you that do age assessment work, that some of this ties in with what's happening with unaccompanied asylum seeking children in terms of the accommodation that's being used to house them and some of the issues that uh, give rise to uh, the, uh, arise in that context. And so the purpose of this webinar is really to give you some insight into some of the work we've been doing, but also to um, highlight the fact that we are able to uh, service questions that come in both in planning, in housing, in licensing, and, and, and in general public law in terms of compliance with policy. And that's really, the, I think, something that we are uniquely positioned to be able to do. So, so what we're going to do is consider the, the background, consider the planning, consider the licensing and housing issues that arise, and hopefully give you some food for thought as to what you can do to prevent the further use of the, the accommodation, whether it's hotel accommodation or other accommodation, for uh, housing asylum seekers. And so with, with that background in mind, I'm going to turn first to Jack Barber, who's going to be telling us about some of the context and the public law angle. Hello everyone, um, I'm Jack Barber. I'm a junior tenant at Cornerstone Barristers. Um, I work across the different areas of law that Chambers does. I've worked with all three contributors uh, today. Um, I'm going to set out a bit of the background to the issue that is presenting many local authorities in across the country today. Um, and I'm also then going to look at the public law issues, which are, begin to, are beginning to emerge a little bit more in the news in recent weeks. Um, first, I'm going to look at some key terms so that we have uh, a shared understanding of the language that we're using today. Um, I'm going to start with the, the meaning of refugee. Um, now, I start with this because it's important to remember, as Colgate said earlier, that there is a humanitarian context to this issue, primarily. Um, a, a refugee is defined in, the article, in Article 1 of the UN Convention on uh, the Status of Refugees. Um, this is a convention that the UK has signed up to and is a, is a signatory to. Um, and a refugee is a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable to or unwill or owing to such a fear is unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country now obviously this is important because um what uh, when when we see small votes or we see we see um people coming to the uk in different ways um these people when they are seeking to claim asylum are, of, are often seeking to, to show that they are a refugee, that they're coming from uh, a, a place of persecution. And that, that's obviously an important factor in terms of considering particular vulnerabilities that arise, but also in terms of considering the context for this problem which is arising. Um, asylum then is the protection that is given by a country to someone fleeing persecution, persecution in their country. Um, as I said, we're a signatory to the UN Convention, so that that refers to refugee status, but also we, we are also a signatory to the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. And so that prevents us from sending people uh, to, to, a, to a particular place where there's a real risk that they might be exposed to torture or inhumane treatment. Um, and so uh, there's a range of bases for the UK to grant humanitarian protection to, to allow people to stay in the country once they a, a, a appear here. Um, and then in terms of asylum seeker, now, um, some refugee charities prefer the term um, people seeking asylum because they feel that the term asylum seeker is, is dehumanizing. But we've used asylum seeker because that's, that's the language of statute. Section 94 
of the Immigration and Asylum Act 1999 defines an asylum seeker for the purposes of accommodation, at least in the, in the context of providing accommodation, uh, as uh, a person who is not under 18, who has made a claim for asylum, which has been recorded by the Secretary of State, uh, but which has not been determined. So, so really what we're thinking about is those people who have arrived here and their status is being determined. Um, it's important to note at this stage that there's a distinction between asylum seekers um, and resettled refugees. Um, now, this is an important distinction because I know that many local authorities have had um, the arrival of a significant number of resettled refugees in recent, in recent months and years. Uh, under the, uh, in, initially, there was a Syria scheme, there was also an Afghan scheme, and more recently, there's also obviously been the Ukrainian resettlement. Um, now, that's different because a lot of the time, uh, resettled refugees are counted outside of the um, statistics when we're talking about asylum seekers, but also they're not necessarily awaiting the determination of an asyl asylum application. Um, and so there's, there's slightly different concerns at play in those contexts, and sometimes the accommodation differs as well. Um, so I'm now going to turn to some key figures. The, the Institute for Government, uh, the, the well-known think tank, has, has spoken about how there's a substantial asylum backlog. Um, we know for certain that the work in progress caseload is substantial and growing, um, and um, the number of applications is very high. In fact, in the last couple of years, um, the number of applications has been a 20-year high, the highest since the early 2000s. Um, now, there's also a significant waiting time for many people who are making applications. And so uh, the IFG figure was that 70% of people are waiting six months for a decision on their application. Now, obviously, that has implications in terms of long term accommodation. Uh, we come talking about months, sometimes years, that people are in long term accommodation. And that's obviously um, having knock on effects in terms of the, the availability of accommodation to account for the number of people who are requiring it. Um, in terms of the demand for um, the our council um, isn't planning to do an application that Joe's going to talk about. Um, Justice Holgate noted that the Home Office's evidence that had been presented to him uh, estimated that at the end of September 2022, uh, there were 99,000 accommodated, um, of, about, of whom about 38,000 uh, were in short-term accommodation. Now, this is, that's just a sign of the scale of, of, of the issue, which is, is, is facing many local authorities across the country. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's been a growth in the need for accommodation, um, which he also sets out in his judgment, the, the details um, for that, so at paragraphs 21 to 29. But um, I think it's important, before we go on to consider the specific uh, legal issues to um, look first at the duties that the Secretary of State uh, for the Home Department is under in relation to uh, accommodation. And so I'm going to walk through now um, the, the general model for accommodating asylum seekers um, and, and then we're going to look at we're going to look at the specific issues that arise. Um, so the Secretary of State has several duties. The first is under section 98 of the uh, Immigration and Asylum Act. 1999. Now, um, this duty basically means that the uh, Secretary of State is under a duty to provide temporary support uh, in the form of accommodation to an asylum seeker who appears to be destitute. Decision under Section 95 has been taken. So this is this is emergency accommodation when people arrive, they need somewhere to stay because they have no other means of supporting themselves and there's a risk effectively of them becoming homeless. Um, the Section 95 of the uh, of the same Act and associated regulations also imposes a duty on the Secretary of State to provide support for asylum seekers and their dependents who appear to the Secretary of State to be or um, to be likely to become destitute within 14 days. Now, support includes accommodation. Uh, and um, normally how this works, as you'll see from this table, is that uh, on, uh, when, when there's no need for emergency accommodation, uh, someone will be put in initial, uh, initial accommodation. Now, that would normally have been one of eight uh, accommodation sites around the country, which are generally short-term, hospital-type environments. But as there's been an increase in demand, 
there have, has been a need for alternative sites because those sites have become overrun. There's been too many people in them. There's simply not capacity. And so the Home Office has um, been turning to contingency sites. Um, now, this, these can be hotels, uh, but as Colgate mentioned earlier, some, there's been some use of barracks or student accommodation, and there's also more recently been thought from politicians that they may begin to use things like disused theme parks or holiday parks uh, or cruise ships. Um, now, um, that can give rise to several issues, which I'll turn to shortly. Um, but um, the second type uh, of accommodation is uh, dispersal accommodation. Now, this is, this is the accommodation which is provided generally on a more long-term basis. It's usually more self-catering type or self-supporting self accommodation, which is designed to support those people for longer periods of time whilst their underlying asylum application is considered. Now, um, the issue that's been arising in, in the dispersal context is that there's simply not a, a significant enough supply of uh, long-term accommodation. And so where there's not been long-term accommodation available, um, again, pro providers uh, on behalf of the Home Office have been turning to contingency type accommodation uh, using hotels and, and the like to, uh, to house people for sometimes significant periods of time. Um, there are other frameworks which um, are worth considering. Um, the, um, you may see references to bridging accommodation in particular circumstances. Um, bridging accommodation is, is a term that was used to house uh, resettled uh, uh, refugees when they, when they came from Afghanistan, for example. Um, that was always designed to be a temporary solution. Uh, I believe it was due to wrap up at the end of last year. Um, but, but there, are, there are individual specific uh, schemes as well with, where different types of accommodation are being used to house vulnerable people who are seeking to come and make their life in the UK. Um, one quick note on funding. Obviously, contingency accommodation has been uh, reported to be extremely expensive in the, in the case of millions a day um, and potentially, I think, a Migration Watch estimated a billion pounds a year or more than a billion pounds a year. Um, in terms of funding that's available to local authorities, um, the Home Office obviously does provide um, an asylum dispersal grant to local authorities, uh, which is a relatively small figure of about £250 per asylum seeker um, as of March 2022. And that's designed to address concerns about uh, pressure on local services. Um, however, there are still great concern about the adequacy of resources being made available to um, those who are housing um, asylum seekers in their locality and the, the pressure and, uh, that that might place on particular local services. So in my remaining time, I'm just going to turn to consider a couple of general public law issues. Um, first, it's worth thinking about the types of decisions that might be um, sought to be challenged in the context of a judicial review, for example. Um, we've seen in recent years, there've been cases uh, where asylum seekers themselves have sought to bring a challenge against the Home Office. Um, in the case of NB, um, a group of asylum seekers sought to challenge the legality of the Home Office's decision to use particular accommodation, that was Napier Barracks, uh, to house um, them for a protracted period of time. Uh, the Claim, their claim for judicial review was allowed on, on the ground that um, it did not comply with minimum standards, uh, that the process for selecting the people to be accommodated was flawed and unlawful, and that there, there, there had also uh, partly made out a claim of false imprisonment. Um, however, there's also the question mark about um, a, a decision to use a particular hotel in a particular locality, and obviously that's where local authorities may begin to become more involved in terms of bringing a claim for judicial review. There's obviously also planning decisions, such as uh, another case involving Napier Barracks. That was to do with a specific a, a special development order and, and the challenge of, of that decision, which um, succeeded on a PSED basis, the Public Sector Equality Duty. Uh, there, the court found that the Public Sector Equality Duty did not have any meaningful regard to uh, the impact of the decision to, um, to house asylum seekers for protracted period of time when making a special development order, uh, they didn't have a sufficient regard to uh, community relations and the impact on community relations. Uh, but then there are also questions of more policy-based questions, as Paul mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, one such 
case, which ended up not actually going to substantive judicial review hearing, was uh, a claim uh, uh, brought by several councils against the Home Office's dispersal policy. Um, the claim was eventually withdrawn by consent because the policy changed during the process of bringing the claim. Um, uh, and that, but there is a cost determination decision which I've set out, which may 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 provide some useful reading to local authority practitioners. Um, before I finish, there are obviously some important limits to judicial review. Um, firstly, obviously, it's a it's a process that is being concerned with the legality of the decision making process, namely rather than uh, the sub challenging the substance of the decision itself. Um, but more importantly, um, there may be questions of standing which arise in relation to the challenge of a particular decision, whether a claimant has sufficient interest in the decision to bring a claim. Um, and um, it also, it's important to always remember that it's a remedy of last resort. So if there's another route by which a decision can be challenged, um, which provides an adequate, adequate remedy, then the claimant would be expected to make use of that alternative route rather than bringing a claim. Um, Finally, it's also important to remember that, that, that it's always um, important to review the situation and actually if a claim becomes academic because, for example, there's a change of policy, it's generally inappropriate to continue to pursue that claim when actually um, it's been made redundant in practical terms. Um, in terms of timing, there's two or three specific points that I want to raise. Firstly, obviously, uh, in general, judicial review must be brought uh, it must be started promptly uh, and any, in any event um, within three months uh, after the grounds for making a claim first arose. However, it's important to note that in a planning context, the time limit is significantly shorter, uh, six weeks usually. Um, and in very specific contexts, uh, such as uh, public procurement cases, the time limit is shorter still. It's often 30 days uh, from the date at which the claimant first knew about the decision. And so it's important to always check in the particular context which you're considering what the time limit is for the action that you're seeking to bring. Um, and obviously it's important to note as well that, that, that those tight time limits don't stop pre-action correspondence being important. And so it's always necessary to take as, as many steps as possible to take pre-action steps early on. Um, so finally, um, I'm not going to go into any detail because they are simply press reports at this point, but there have been signs recently that local authorities are beginning to consider taking judicial review action against the Home Office and the Secretary of State for the Home Office in relation to the use of particular hotels in their areas. Uh, the cases of Torbay and East Lindsay are both um, have seem to be at very early stages at this point, um, but there are, there are indications that things like consultation like failure to consider the impact on local services uh, and uh, failure to take account of planning policy considerations are all things that local authorities are beginning to think about when seeking to address the issue of accommodation asylum seekers in their boroughs. So thank you very much. I'm going to pass on to Dean. Before um, I hand over to Joe, who's going to be telling us about the planning angle in relation to these issues, I just want to flag that there is a Q&A function on the webinar where you can post questions and the speakers will keep an eye with a view to either incorporating the answers in their talks or coming to them at the end if we have time. Um, for those of you that have joined us late, just to flag that the recordings, uh, the webinar is being recorded. And finally, also just to flag that you will get a copy of the slides after the webinar, in addition to being able to view the recording. Um, so with those um, housekeeping matters out of the way, Joe, if I could hand over to you to tell us about the planning angle. Thanks, Kuljit, and thanks, uh, Jack, as well. Um, so ju just really following on from what Jack said, there's, there's obviously a, a multi-angle approach to the issue of um, accommodating asylum seekers. And one of the ways in which um, local authorities have set about trying to control um, the issue in, in their area is, is through the planning regime. Now, obviously, Jack's just told you about some judicial reviews, which are a different way that they've attempted to um, control that. But I'm just going to focus on one uh, route by which local authorities have tried to control it, which is the use of a planning injunction. And a few of these have made the headlines, if you read those kinds of headlines, um, in, in the last couple of months. So I'm going to focus in on, on those. 
Now, um, the, the mechanism is Section 187B of the Town and Country Planning Act. That's the power to get an injunction to stop a breach of planning control. And classically, these have been used, lots of the leading cases on 187B injunctions are in respect of gypsies and travellers, another traditionally kind of vilified minority group. So um, this is not an asylum-seeking horse here. This is a picture of a, a, a gypsy and traveller site. But the, um, the 187B case law is is mainly focused on, not mainly, but there's a lot of them that deal with gypsies and travellers and trying to either stop gypsies and travellers moving on to land or to try and get them off once they're on. So that's a just a, a bit of background. What we're talking about here in terms of all of these cases is the initial accommodation stage of Jack's slide earlier on, not the dispersal or settlement or any of that nature, but the kind of first accommodation of people. And, and the particular context is the use of hotels in mainly towns um, for accommodating asylum seekers in a, in what is intended to be a short-term uh, way. So, Jack, that takes us to the next uh, slide. Just a, a bit of law, first of all. Um, the power to get an injunction to, to um, restrain a breach of planning control is a, a one of the range of enforcement powers contained within the, the planning regime. Um, you, you can get an injunction to restrain a breach of planning control if a local authority considers it's necessary or expedient, which is a pretty low test. So if, if you think it's worthwhile doing that as a local authority, you probably cross that threshold. Very few challenges deal with that part of the, uh, of the, of the provision. But the point is that it's to restrain an actual or apprehended breach of planning control. And what's important to note here is that you need to identify before you can apply for an injunction to stop something happening, whether actual or apprehended, apprehended is you've got to identify a breach of planning control, at least a potential breach of planning control. I'm going to talk a bit more about how that comes in uh, in a little while. And the particularly attractive thing about planning injunctions is you don't have to exercise other enforcement powers first. There's no requirement to serve an enforcement notice first, no requirement to prosecute for breach of an enforcement notice or show that you've gone through the other powers. The idea of the injunction is it provides in the appropriate case a, a swift and powerful tool for stopping something happening. Um, now, I should just note before we get into the weeds of this that I know in the audience we've got probably a range from, and I've seen some real planning experts for whom lots of this will be old news, but also some people who probably don't have much engagement with the planning regime. So I'm going to try and steer a course through it that um, remains interesting for the former and is informative for the for the latter. But forgive me if I'm either teaching grandmothers suck eggs on some of these points or being a bit too esoteric about it, but I'll, I'll do my best. And at least I've included some pictures. So if it really is uh, too boring, then you can just enjoy the pictures. Um, so uh, ne next slide, please, uh, Jack. Some of you will be old enough to remember an advert. Um, it was the NatWest many years ago where this lady complained, amongst other things, that her bank had become a trendy wine bar. I don't know if any of you remember that, with a kind of roll of her eyes. Well, that that was a that was they didn't say it, but that was a material change of use. A change from a a, a bank to a trendy wine bar would have been one of the two ways that planning control tries to control the use of land: either building operations, building a house, building a shed, building a barn, or what we call a material change of use, which is a change of use of land in a way that is material for planning purposes. And again, I'll say a little bit more about that in the context of hotels and hostels in a little while, but that's the breach of planning control that's been at play in all of the injunction applications to date that have, that have dealt with this question of uh, accommodating asylum seekers and specifically the change or alleged change of use from hotel use to hostel use, which is said to be a material change of use in those cases. So just um, honing in on, on that particular issue, uh, next slide, Jack, the, the wonderful um, Grand Budapest Hotel, one of my favourite films. Uh, this is a kind of quintessential use of land as a hotel, albeit somewhere in the uh, Eastern Alps, not in the UK jurisdiction. But we all know what a, what a hotel looks like, right? They look a bit like that, if you're lucky enough to go and stay at the Grand Budapest Hotel. Um, uh, on the other hand, we all probably know or think we know what a hostel looks like. And Jack, that's the next slide. Probably don't look much. I don't think the rooms at the Grand Budapest Hotel look like this. This is an example, just one example of a kind of classic youth hostel type um, arrangement. So what we're concerned with here with these uh, applications for injunctions is the, the change from youth as a, as a hotel 
which we think we all understand what it looks like, to the chain, to the use as a, as a hostel, much more akin to what we see on the screen uh, now. So next slide. One of those hotels, if you're unlucky enough to have to spend some time in Ipswich, and I, I say immediately that that's just to wind Jack up. I'm a Norwich City fan. And I'm from Norfolk. And so for me, the idea of spending any time in Ipswich is, is a terrible idea. But I am going to move to just outside Ipswich in the summer. So I'm going to need to change my tune. If you're unlucky enough to have to stay some time in Ipswich, you might choose to stay in the Novotel. This is a picture of the Novotel, the central hotel uh, in Ipswich. And it's the subject of one of these injunction applications that was determined in November. And in this case, Serco, the government's um, contractor who deals with the accommodation of asylum seekers in this way, uh, sought to place asylum, take over the whole hotel uh, and place asylum seekers uh, in there. Um, and the local authority, Ipswich Borough Council, resisted that, didn't want that to happen and sought an injunction under 187B to stop it happening. At the same time, a hotel in the East Riding of Yorkshire, similar sort of thing, Serco wanted to put asylum seekers in there, East Riding sought an injunction. Um, and those um, two applications for, in, for injunctions were eventually heard by Mr Justice Holgate, who you'll hear more about in due course. He's deciding all of these cases at the moment. Um, and in each case, the, um, the, the local authority said, this is a breach of planning control, it's a material change of use without planning permission, and we should have an injunction restraining it, stopping Serco on behalf of the government from putting asylum seekers into these uh, hotels. Now, just a bit of a deep dive into how those uh, matters have been litigated and how Mr Justice Holgate has dealt with them so far. So ne next slide, please, uh, Jack. W one of the, th the, the features of the planning regime is something called the use classes order. And what the use classes order does is define various uses of land in a particular way. Uh, you, you might have heard of some of them, A1, Class E, th those sorts of things. And then it, it establishes that changes of use within those classes is not a material change of use, and also identifies certain changes between classes, so from a certain class to another class, are not material changes of use. So it deems them to be not material, so you don't need planning permission for them. So that's as far as it goes, but there's a sort of common misunderstanding about the use classes order that somehow anything that isn't subject to the deeming in that way is a material change of use, and, and that's wrong. So just because a change from one class to another class is not deemed to be not a material change of use doesn't mean that it is a material change of use. Um, in every case, you have to ask, as a question of fact and degree, is this change a material change of use? Now, in lots of cases, you know, changing from a bank to a trendy wine bar back then was a material change of use. Possibly not now, but that's another story. Uh, helpfully here, there's also a third sort of concept, which is what's called not a use class, but a sui generis use. I'm allergic to using Latin. I hate it when lawyers use Latin, but can't escape it here. Sui generis means of its own type. Um, and it's not a use class in itself. It's just a description of a bunch of uses that don't fall into any of the specified use classes. Hotel use is defined as class C1. Hostel used to be in the same class until 1994, and then it got taken out and is now a sui generis use. So there's no automatic planning permission to move from a hotel use to a hostel use. It doesn't follow that moving from a hotel use to a hostel use is always a material change of use. You have to ask, as a question of fact and degree, is that change material? Now, in all of these injunction cases, the allegation by the local authority seeking the injunction was that this was a material change of use on, on the facts. And, and that's one of the two big issues that Mr Justice Holgate has looked at in the two judgments that published judgments that we've seen so far. So next slide, Jack, please. Um, fact and degree, a, a phrase beloved of planners and even more beloved of planning lawyers because it just gives rise to loads of possibility of litigation. So as I've said already, change from a hotel to a hostel, not always a material change of use, question of fact and degree on the particular case. And Mr Justice Holgate says in the um, decision in the Ipswich and East Riding case in November, uh, that these are the relevant factors or might be the relevant factors when considering that change. First of all, you've got to look at the facts as to the nature of the use. So what was the use as a hotel and what did it look like? 
what's the what's the intended use as a hostel and what does that look like and then a, co a comparison of those two and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute the second point is you can look at both the on-site and the off-site effects of change so on-site obviously you know how the land will be used uh, differently off-site is what effect that different use might have on other surrounding matters and I'm just thinking of some of the questions that came up earlier and some of the things that Kuljit mentioned which is strain on local services impact on schools those sorts of things they would probably qualify as off-sites effective effects of change and would be potentially relevant to this question of whether we've got a material change of use really importantly this third one at least so far is the policies of the development plan every local authority is supposed to publish a development plan and keep it up to date they don't always do that um but the policies of the development plan might well be relevant. And I'm going to finish with a couple of suggestions of how that has, in the appropriate case, been at the heart of the decision to make an injunction. And, and then the fourth point is that precedent, so looking at previous cases about changes from hotel to hostel on the facts, are unlikely to help much because this is a fact-specific inquiry and will depend in each case on the particular circumstances, both on-site and off-site uh, and policy development plan so you're not likely to get a prescriptive case that says if you can tick all these boxes that's a material change of use so next slide please uh, jack um mr justice holgate says that in each case hotel use and hostel use are are quite a broad spectrum of use even within themselves so you've got hotels at the top end of the scale grand budapest hotel which look a particular way but at the other end of the scale You've got certain uses of hotels which actually look quite like hostels, short term, cheap, possibly even um, fairly Spartan rooms, those kinds of things. And on the other hand, hostels, too, you've got a broad range at the kind of classic end. You've got shared rooms where you just book a bunk bed, but lots and lots of hostels, youth hostels, particularly. You can book your own private room and it might have a double bed in it and look very much like a hotel room to all intents and purposes. Price difference not, might not be very much compared different compared to a budget hotel and so on. And there have been various suggestions in the cases, most of which Mr Justice Holgate dismisses, of trying to pinpoint the key characteristics in each case of a hotel and a hostel use. The point is there's a lot of overlap. So it's a difficult distinction or a fine distinction, as Mr Justice Holgate says in that case. So all of that's about the first question, which is, is there a for an injunction at least, a tribal issue as to whether there's a material change of use here. Is there a breach of planning control that could be restrained by an injunction if it was appropriate to do so? But even if you can get past that, and I pause to say that in all of the injunction applications that have made so far, um, the judge has found that there is at least a tribal issue of a material change of use from the hotel use to the hostel use. Now that won't be the case in every case, but in all the cases that have been heard so far, that hurdle has been cleared. But injunctions are a discretionary remedy. So even if you can show that there's a material change of use, even a slam dunk, not even a tribal issue, you still have to ask, does the balance of convenience favour an injunction in these circumstances? And, and this is the hurdle that so far the majority of the applications have failed on. A couple haven't, and I'll come to those. So the balance of convenience essentially asks, a bit like those scales there, the, the factors in favour of granting the injunction and restraining the breach of planning control, do they outweigh sufficiently the, the harm that would be caused if it was allowed to continue such that an injunction should follow in the, in that, in the court's discretion? And the factors here, again, that there's no prescriptive list, but these are some of the ones that Mr Justice Holgate has pointed out in the, in the cases. First of all, the flagrancy of the breach. So is this done deliberately? Is it done in obvious disregard of the planning system. Paul say in most cases, that's not the case. Serco have usually given good notice, so on and so forth. So there hasn't been any flagrancy, although there's been an attempt to argue flagrancy by the local authorities. Urgency, another big one. Is there an urgency to, to do this? And, and in every case, there'll be a, um, an investigation into quite how urgent this needed to be. And of course, you can get a, an injunction without notice in the most urgent cases. Most of these will be injunctions on notice. So you've given... Um, notice to the other side, to Serco in most cases. Uh, the next factor is harm. On the one hand, what's the planning harm that needs to be stopped? You know, what is it that's going on that needs to be um, stopped here and, and quantifying it and assessing it? On the other hand, uh, what's the harm if, if the injunction does issue? 
um, you know, what are the effects of having to not use that hotel as, as, an, as accommodation for asylum seekers. Hardship to the defendant, a um, bit difficult to see it as hardship, but connected to harm if Serco or the government, by extension, uh, will stop from doing this, uh, quantify that. Are there any alternatives, history up to this point, and, and whether damages would be an adequate remedy? Now, in most of these cases, you, you don't need to give an undertaking in damages as you would normally for a an injunction. There's a case called Kirkley's and Wicks, which says that a local authority exercising its enforcement powers shouldn't have to give an undertaking in damages. But as I said, it's this test where um, all those injunctions that have failed, ultimately, this is where they've failed on the balance of convenience. Now, there are two so far that have succeeded. So both Ipswich and East Riding failed. Eventually, they got the injunction first of all. And then when it came before Mr Justice Holgate to be confirmed, he refused to continue the injunctions on the basis of the balance of convenience didn't favour their continuation. But there are two that Mr Justice Holgate has continued. Um, one is Great Yarmouth and, and one is um, Skegness. Now, both of those injunctions are about hotels in towns which are tourist seaside towns. And in both cases, the key point that Mr Justice Holgate alighted on in thinking that it or in concluding that it was convenient to continue the injunctions was that the local authority had a particular policy in their development plan protecting in a specific way tourism accommodation essentially the hotels on the seafront that were being suggested to be used in this way so each authority in that case ran a case backed up by evidence from their local plan that said um, there's a particular issue here with tourist accommodation uh, and handing this over to asylum seekers would harm the aspiration of the local plan to keep tourism accommodation and, and therefore keep the economy of the town buzzing. Now, that doesn't always work because that argument was also run in lots of the cases that, that fell, certainly Ipswich, East Riding and Fenland in uh, in the town of Wisbeach, which is not by the beach, confusingly, it's um, nowhere near the beach. Um, in all of those cases, they ran a bit of a case to say, well, tourism uses need to be protected. But, but Mr Justice Holgate kind of dismissed those out of hand. Now, it's well worth reading the two cases, the, the Ipswich and East Riding and also the Fenland one, just to see how he deals with the evidence that's put forward. And I think it's fair to say that in Ipswich and East Riding, he was pretty unimpressed with the evidence of harm, of the evidence of why this, why this would cause harm if allowed to continue and why this temporary use would cause sufficient planning harm as to, to require to be restrained. So it's well worth, if you're thinking about applying one of these injunctions in your local authority, reading the bits of his judgment in each case that, that deal with the evidence. Um, and just a, a last point on that, in the Wisbeach case, there was an attempt to rely on the police evidence to say that the asylum seekers would come to harm themselves if they were housed in this hotel in Wisbeach. Because Wisbeach is a very deprived town, and there was also a, a pretty spurious attempt to say that there was a big issue of child abduction in Wisbeach. And if there were children housed in the hotel, they would then be in danger of being caught up in that child abduction problem in, in Fenland. Mr Justice Hoggate rejected that out of hand, said there was absolutely no evidence and these hotels would have security and so on. So the evidence is key. If you're by the sea and you've got special policies saying you need to protect those uses, then you might get home. But generally, this is a fact-specific inquiry and at the moment, the wind seems to be blowing against the injunctions, unless you can show a very specific reason um, for, for continuing it. So that's what I wanted to say about, about planning. I'm going to hand over to Dean now. Joe, thank you very much. And uh, Jack, thank you for, for doing the slides. Um, time is short um, this morning, but uh, I'm going to use up just a few valuable seconds uh, to pass on what I know will be uh, shared congratulations, shared that is not just by Joe and Jack, um, but by the rest of Chambers to Kuljits, who many of you will know uh, has recently been appointed. Silken from March, I think, I think it's March, will be Kuljit Bogle KC. So from all of us, Kuljit, our heartfelt congratulations. Now, the Housing Act 2004. Um, next slide, please, Jack. As many of you will know, the Housing Act 2004 enacts uh, a range of provisions that are intended to regulate the condition the management, use and occupation of residential accommodation in the private rented sector. In the context of asylum seeker hotel accommodation, certain of its provisions are of particular, if admittedly arguable, relevance to local housing authorities and accommodation providers alike. 
So uh, part one, for example, enacts the housing health and safety rating system, which is currently under review, uh, which enables local housing authorities to assess and to bring about the removal or mitigation at least of hazards that affect residential premises. Part two uh, enables local housing authorities to require the licensing uh, and, and to regulate houses in multiple occupation. And then regulations made under section 234 part seven oblige those managing HMOs in summary uh, to ensure that HMOs meet minimum health and safety standards. And those regulations are the management of HMOs, England, or as the case may be, uh, Wales. Apologies to those from Wales for not including Wales on the, on the slide. Regulations 2006. So uh, as you'll appreciate, the Act contains a suite of really quite far-reaching provisions, which potentially at least might enable local housing authorities to regulate and, if necessary, enforce minimum accommodation, safety and management standards in a district privately rented sector and potentially in the hotels used to accommodate asylum seekers in those districts. But, and this is the big issue with which many, including local housing authorities nationwide have been grappling, do those provisions actually apply? So I intend to use my time today to guide you through, frankly, the maze of relevant uh, legislative provisions and to flag up some of the considerations that would likely feed an analysis of that issue were it to come before a court or tribunal. Uh, next slide, please, Jack. And the, uh, the starting point, of course, uh, would be uh, the provisions of the Act and the regulations themselves. So as you'll either know, or we'll certainly learn from this slide, by section one, part one of the 2004 Act applies to residential premises, where residential premises means either A, a dwelling, B, an HMO, C, unoccupied HMO accommodation, or D, any common parts of a building containing one or more flats. An HMO is defined by sections 254 to 259 for the purposes of part one, at least, without the exceptions to which schedule 14 refers. Mandatory and additional licensing under part two applies to certain HMOs, where by section 77, HMO is defined by, again, sections 254 to 259, this time with the exceptions to which <clears throat> Schedule 14 refers. And the 2006 management regulations, which are made under section 234, apply to any HMO in England, or as the case may be Wales, other than a section 257 HMO. And in this context, we're not really dealing with section 257 HMOs, which are of course regulated separately under the 2007 regulations. So in the present context in which the hotels used to accommodate asylum seekers tend not to be dwellings as defined by section one, the answer to the question posed at the start of my talk is likely I would suggest to be the answer to the further question, are the hotels HMOs to which sections one, section 77, and the 2006 regulations refer? And in context, that probably means, and that probably leads us to the, the standard HMO test, which is enacted by section 254, subsection two, which takes us neatly, Jack, to the next slide, please. So under section 2542, subsection two, that is the key is likely to lie, I would suggest in subsection C, which requires that the hotel's living accommodation is the occupant's only or main residence. Uh, and more particularly, to my mind, it's likely to lie in the requirement that it be a residence per se. The other requirements of that particular subsection tend in context not to give rise to real controversy. So the hotels that we're concerned with tend to consist of bedrooms that are not self-contained flats. They tend to be occupied by persons who don't form a single household and have no other place to live. So issues of main residence tend not to arise. Um, rarely are the hotels used for anything else. So they're block booked. And in any events, section 260, as many of you will know, enacts a statutory presumption that the only use condition is met unless the contrary is shown. Uh, and though rents are rarely payable, the hotels do receive consideration for the asylum seekers occupation of the rooms. And even if the hotels occupiers don't share basic amenities, cooking facilities, toilets, washing facilities, 
the rooms they occupy tend to lack one or more of them. Further, um, although a building won't be an HMO for the purposes of part two at least, if it falls within one of the exceptions enacted by Schedule 14, rarely in context do those exceptions tend to apply. So for example, they tend not to be controlled, uh, the hotels that is, or managed by public sector bodies to which paragraphs two and 2A of Schedule 14 refer. Those being, for example, local housing authorities, registered providers of social housing in England or in Wales registered social landlords. And they tend not to be regulated as paragraph three requires, um, that is by any of the legislation that's listed in schedule one to the snappily entitled licensing and management of HMOs and other houses, miscellaneous provisions, England, or as the case may be Wales regulations, 2006, deep breath. So the, the issue is likely to be whether the living accommodation provided by the hotels is either A, the occupants only or main residence, or B, is to be treated as such. Before we pass on to the next slide, um, just a little bugbear of mine that if anyone from the Home Office is actually listening, many of the exceptions, uh, that is the legislation that's listed in Schedule 1 uh, to the regulations, is, is now out of date and, and seriously needs to be updated. Um, so on the next slide, uh, persons treated as meeting the HMO residence condition, certain persons are treated statutorily as occupying accommodation as their own your main residence. And materially in this context, by section 259 and regulations made under it, they include asylum seekers and their dependents who are provided with accommodation under section 95 of the Immigration and Asylum Act 99 that's funded wholly or partly by NAS. Uh, that is because they're either destitute or likely to become destitute and so in, they're in need of accommodation. Note, and this comes back to one of the questions that I think was posed in our question and answer forum, they do not include those who are provided with accommodation under section 98. That is because they require accommodation while the Secretary of State is considering their application for longer term support under section 95. And I'd suggest had, had, had Parliament intended recipients of section 98 support to be treated as occupier accommodation, as their own your main residence, and I emphasize the word treated, one would have thought that Parliament would have provided as such. That, of course, though, is not the end of the analysis, because for all those not treated as meeting the residence conditions statutorily, the issue is whether, as a matter of fact and law, they occupy the living accommodation in, for example, the hotel, as their own your main residence nonetheless. And that rather begs the question. Uh, to which I referred previously, whether the accommodation provided, or at least uh, intended to be provided on a merely temporary or transient basis, can in principle be a residence within the meaning of section 254. Uh, next slide, please, Jack. And that question was discussed recently, although admittedly only briefly, by Martin Roger QC, as he then was in the Lands Chamber of the Upper Tribunal in Sutton and Norwich City Council, where he observed that, and you'll see on the slide, uh, that requirement, that is the residence condition in section 254, suggests a definite policy choice to limit the scope of local authority responsibilities and to exclude the sort of temporary accommodation which had been found to come within the 1985 Act, that reference being to the Housing Act 1985. And the definition of HMO in section 345 of, of the Housing Act 1985 didn't, of course, include any residence requirement, with the result that in the course of time, uh, accommodation provided by the likes of hotels, religious retreats, and even in one case, a house used to accommodate school children over the course of the summer holidays had been found to be HMOs. Decisions about which um, there was, if one delves into the the green and the white papers that preceded enactment of the 2004 Act, um, uh, which caused disquiet uh, uh, politically and otherwise, uh, legally as well, uh, hence the Deputy President's remarks. But it's important to note that that remark is obiter only. And it wasn't necessary to the determination of the appeal in Sutton and Norwich, and the upper tribunal certainly heard no argument about the issue. 
So under the 2004 Act, there is simply no authority on point, and the issue remains very much at large. The proper determination of which I would suggest is likely to depend on a proper and contextual interpretation of the word residence. Why do I say that? Um, that takes us to the next slide. I say that because words such as reside, residence, dwell and dwelling take on different shades of meaning according to their statutory context. And there's a, a very helpful and interesting discussion about this uh, in uh, the case of N and Lewisham on the Borough Council um, uh, uh, back in 2014. So their statutory context, the statutory context of the word residence uh, is not only material, therefore, it's likely to be instructive and even key to the proper interpretation and construction of that particular um, term. To illustrate and understand that point, it's only necessary, I'd suggest, to compare um, the quality of a occupation that's required to establish or maintain security of tenure or the right to succeed under the Rent Act 77, or indeed the Housing Acts 85 and 88, which involve an element of homemaking with the quality of occupation that's required by contrast to establish the likes of normal residence for the purposes of homelessness applications under the Housing Act 1996, which doesn't require any kind of homemaking element per se. And if one then considers the policy objectives of the 2004 Act, which um, as authorities, various authorities over time have held include importantly, the protection of the vulnerable from housing related serious housing related safety risks including death by fire then one is surely bound to ask whether a narrow interpretation of residence would serve those purposes arguably not and i'm going to be so bold to suggest very probably not uh, which takes us to the next slide because that proposition does seem to find support in very recent data, again from Martin Roger QC, as he then was in the upper tribunal. So in Global 100 Limited and Jimenez, as you'll see on the slide, he held, uh, and this was part of the ratio of the case, that effective regulation uh, and action by local housing authorities to, to, to reduce risks to the health and well-being of residents of repurposed or converted living accommodation is as important an objective as it has ever been. The limits of effective regulation are set by the definition of house in multiple occupation in section 254. And it's important that this definition is not interpreted so narrowly as to frustrate the achievement of the statutory purpose. Words on which I have little doubt local authorities nationwide will be relying should this matter come before a court or tribunal. So it would be reasonable to assume, looking at those last two slides, looking at the recent dicta, to assume that a court or tribunal would adopt a very broad definition of residence in order to maximize the protection that was intended to be available to the often vulnerable occupants of multi-occupied accommodation. Query just how broad would any proposal or broad interpretation be would it be so broad as to include all and any accommodation, however transiently occupied? Clearly not. The residence condition must serve some purpose, I would suggest. So for example, a hotel room used as holiday accommodation would surely fall short of that particular threshold. Would it be wide enough to include hotel accommodation used to provide section 98 support, at least ostensibly intended to be on a transient, very short term basis? Well, that's where the battleground may really lie. And in that respect, and time being against me, I'm going to leave you with the rather tempting proposition of appellate and tribunal proceedings, because surely the appellate, and tribu appellate courts and tribunals will wait. Uh, and uh, if, of course, you'd like to instruct me in any of those, <laughs> I'd, be, <laughs> I'd be very glad to receive the instructions. But I hope that you found that um, it, not, not just um, informative, but, uh, but, but interesting. They certainly weren't slides as colourful as Joe's, but uh, I hope they pointed or guided you through the maze of the 2004 Act statutory provisions.
Uh, and uh, and with that, over to you, Kuljit. Thank you, Dean. I think um, Joe wanted to come in on just something that he wanted to um, um, pick up on that was covered earlier. If I may, my slides may be colourful, but I think I got a bit carried away with the picture of the seaside. Um, it's been pointed out to me by Dean Flower, who's who's here and works for East Lindsay, that in fact the Skegness application mm. hasn't yet been determined one way or another. So Great Yarmouth, the injunction was continued, but we haven't seen the judgment yet. But we know that the key point of Great Yarmouth, or um, the local authorities' uh, point, was that um, that there was a specific policy protecting those hotel uses. Skegness, East Lindsay, we're going to make the same argument. We haven't yet seen that decision. The only two decisions that we've had published are the, first of all, the decision East Riding, uh, and secondly, the um, Wisbeach one, which is called Fenland, which refers back to Ipswich and East Riding for the principles, and Fenland just deals with the, with the facts. So sorry if I got excited by the picture of ice creams and buckets and spades. I think that's completely understandable. It is heading towards lunchtime and I'm um, not sure I have ice cream, but certainly um, something um, satisfy the, the, the noisy stomach. Um, we've overrun, so I'm, I'm not going to invite the panel to deal with any other questions. I know that um, looking at the Q&A, some of those questions have already been answered in a written format and others have been picked up as the speakers have gone along. I hope you've all found that useful. Um, I, I, I told you they were experts in their field and they, and they certainly are. Um, the web recording is going to be available on our Chamber's website, and for those of you that missed what I said earlier, um, that's accessible not only to those of you that are registered, but if you want to share that recording with anybody else that you think might be interested in the subject matter, then please feel free to do so. The slides will also be made available with various references and case citations. And of course, as, as Dean's mentioned, if there's anything on which you would like specific instructions, particularly on some of the complex areas that I mentioned, then of course, uh, you know where we are. There are some contact details on the slide. Uh, please do get in touch. And thank you for coming.